Hello, and welcome to another episode of the B2B Founders Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Trainer. Today, I have David Premer on the program. David is the author of a new book called Sell the Way You Buy. He's also the CEO and founder of Cerebral Selling, a sales training company. David has a unique perspective of sales from not only a B2B founder, but also he ran sales for a large, very large selling organization at salesforce.com. David's approach combines science and empathy for what I believe is the key to sales success in the modern B2B space. In today's episode, we discuss why buying is belief-driven and how to set yourself and your team up for success. And if you can't get your sales team to believe in your product or service, especially with conviction and confidence, your team will more than likely, at least your sales team, will fail. I believe this is why the vast majority of the B2B startups struggle to get beyond the founder's network. This is an important topic. We also discuss the power of being a subject matter expert, why content and taking friction out of your customer process is the key to the long game success. Cold calling is not optimal, but if you have to do it, David shares his best practices, why founders have trouble asking for money, i.e. the sale, and how to change that. This is an episode if you are a founder, your sales team is struggling with sales. And as a reminder, if you listen to this podcast and enjoy it, please subscribe on your favorite platform and share it with your friends and colleagues that might also enjoy it. Thanks for listening. And now on to the interview. Hey, good morning, David. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Brett. Great to be with you. Uh, it's great to have you, and there's so many paths we can go down today, but before we get started, why don't you tell the folks a little bit about you know, what you're working on today, who you work with, and th then we'll jump into the topic. Yeah. So again, my name is David Premer. I'm the founder and I say chief sales scientist of Cerebral Selling, which is a, a practice dedicated to uh, teaching the art and science of modern selling through the lens of science and empathy. So that's, that's primarily what I do today, just you know, preaching the gospel trying to help people do sales uh, the right and best and modern way. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and two, there is a book and that's kind of where I think we, we should start off as, you know, we were chatting off a line a little bit that, you know, my audience is B2B founders. Some may have a sales background. Most probably don't. And with, with the book you wrote, you know, I think, you know, talking about the science of sales and the title being sell the way you buy, right. It just, just makes a lot of sense. So I, Maybe to, to start us off, tell us a little bit you know, t about the book and then why did you write the book? Yeah, well, here, here's the thing. So I started my career, everyone gets into sales by accident. You know, doctors and accountants don't, don't get into those professions uh, by accident, but we, we all do. And so I started my career as a research scientist over 20 years ago, and I ended up getting into sales at the turn of the dot-com boom around 1999, 2000. So I'm kind of like, an, like most of us, I'm like an outsider. I got into sales by accident but absolutely fell in love with sales. And so over the course of those next 20 years, I spent my time across four amazing B2B growth startups. I've been a founder before, spent five years at Salesforce after they acquired my third startup. And through all that time, I realized you know, a couple of things. Number one, I, I love sales. Sales is so, it's such an amazing profession. It's so nuanced and, and it, there's winning and losing. It's got everything you want, right, in a, in a career. But when you tell someone you're in sales, you automatically become the enemy, right? Yes, and so, yes. so I realized, you know, for all of us, we love to buy stuff, but we just hate talking to salespeople. And, you know, this isn't just me saying that. There's a lot of great research. One of my favorite uh, authors, Dan Pink, talked about it in his book, To Sell as Human, how when you just tell someone you're in sales or selling, the, the reaction is 80% visceral negative. And so over the course of that 20 years, I, I learned there's various mechanisms and pathways by which people make purchasing decisions and, and the way we actually buy, while it's changed a lot in the last little while, it's often not clear to us as human beings, like how we make purchasing decisions. And so this just completely sparked my curiosity. And so over the course of time, I've just been, you know, assimilating knowledge and trying to learn about the pathways by which we make these decisions, how people buy, how we can act empathetically. And so this all culminated in, in this book, Sell the Way You Buy which is kind of my synthesis of, of kind of modern selling from, from the perspective of science and empathy. Yeah, that's awesome. And I do want to break that down. I'm just curious from also from your perspective, since you've been on the side of the founder and growing a startup, and I'm assuming, you know, a very small team when you started and basically doing the sales yourself, 
to transitioning to salesforce.com, which, you know, would be considered, you know, probably the leader, at least in inside sales selling, you know, a number of years ago, you know, what was the, the difference between those two? And did that also factor into writing the book and sparking the curiosity, if you will? Yeah, well, I'll tell you like the, one of the biggest differences, and there's certainly there's tons of differences. I mean, when I started at Salesforce, there were 6,000 people. This was in 2012. When I left five years later, there was 24,000 people and now they have 50,000 people. So they're just an absolute machine. Crazy. But the, so my, my startup was small when we were acquired, we were about 50 people. And you know, one of the biggest differences when you go to like a big company, besides the process, I say process because I'm Canadian, by the way. <laughs> That's okay, so besides, <laughs> besides the process and those kinds of things, it's the, just the sheer access to data. So you can have a sales team at a startup, you have two salespeople, five, 10, 50, 30 salespeople, it's different when you have thousands of salespeople and you have a kind of a comp plan that's like uniform across the team. You have thousands of customers, people making you know, tens of thousands of calls a day and you get to see that data. You just learn things you cannot learn when you're working in a smaller environment. So it was really cool to see the trends and patterns. Obviously from a science perspective, you, know, you have to have a large enough sample size for the data to be meaningful. So that was probably like one of the biggest things was just being able to have access to all sorts of amazing data to kind of help fuel, not just our sales motion, but really understand kind of like the science behind why things worked or why they didn't. Yeah. I'm a huge believer in, in data and making database decisions. I think my undergrad degree, well, I wasn't think it was in economics. And so even though I never went down that path, I think still fundamentally, I think about, you know, the numbers and the data, you know, data doesn't lie. Assuming you have good data. And, you know, one of the sayings that I always like to say is, you know, math or sales is a math equation. But then when I saw your book talking about the science behind it, I'm like, all right, let's, let's dig into this. So, you know, based on, again, most of my audience probably doesn't have a sales background. And so the default is features and benefits, right? Buy this, look at all these cool things. And there's, and I'm just not saying startups, you know, enterprise companies still default to look at all the features and things that we do versus maybe the problems that we solve. So, you know, what does the science tell us today? And again, you don't have to give away all your trade secrets because I want people mm -hmm. to buy the book, but maybe kind of <laughs> outline what's a good way for founders and maybe their first salesperson to think about, you know, how do I optimize my time and avoid some of the mistakes that, I'm sure you coach and train against. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you, like, just back to your comment question, because I know a lot of your listeners are B2B founders. One of the things that's, you know, really important, I believe, is that if you want to grow and scale, you got to put your message out there, right? To be heard, you have to almost hold it up like a lightning rod, because so many buyers these days, and this is not me saying, you know, I'm a big fan of the, uh, the Edelman Trust Barometer. So Edelman's an organization, does tons of research. And they found that, you know, almost two thirds of buyers are what, what they refer to as belief driven. So they make purchasing decisions based on a company's position on various issues unrelated to the solution. So when you put out that kind of lightning rod and you say like at our company, we believe that. And you see companies that do this really well, like the Teslas and Apples and so on. And, and people love these brands, not because of the products. I mean, the products are great, but because of what they stand for. And so I think one of the best tips you can, you can do, I mean, as a B2B founder is put your content out there. So for me, you know, I put all my content out there. There's certainly the book and I hope people buy it, but you know, you can get a ton of my content on my website, on my blog, my YouTube channel, give it away. It doesn't cannibalize, you know, anything. No one's going to not, you know, not hire you because you gave something away for free on the website. On the contrary, it, it engenders a strong degree of reciprocity, which is a scientific principle around, you know, how to be persuasive. When you give things away, you do things for people, they feel indebted to you. And there's lots of macro ways to do that by putting content out. And there's lots of micro ways of, of doing that. Simply let by, for example, when you reach out to someone, a customer, do your freaking homework before you call that customer, right? Like if you, if it's personalized, if you, the customer can tell that you put effort into the outreach, it makes them feel good, right? So anyways, that's a little aside, let your content help drive your business. But to your question, you know, people, you know, what can science tell us? People first and foremost, by feelings they buy based on emotion they will later they will later or sometimes in the moment justify based on logic and you know the the example i often give is i say you know if i were to ask you to write down now we're in the middle of the pandemic so it might be a little bit different now versus people traveling and at their offices and so on but if i were to ask you to write down everything you ate for lunch over the last month 
And then I said, I'm going to take that list. I'm going to show that list to your doctor. I'm going to ask your doctor, you know, what percentage of the time did this person eat the best thing for them? And I say best as defined by calorically, food groups, sure. portion size. I, what would you say, Brett? Like, I, I, you might be a pretty healthy guy. Sometimes I stumble upon he healthy guys. Well, what would you say? Like, how often are you making objectively the best eating decisions for you? Best, yeah, I probably put in the 70% range somewhere <laughs> in that area. I try to now. If you would have asked me this three years ago, it'd probably have been closer to 30 or 40 percent. Well, there you go, right? You know, I, I ask this, you know, in, in, you, if you're listening, it, there's no judgment, think about what this number is for you, but it's not a hundred. It's not for most people, it's actually not above 30 or 40. To your point, you know, most people are like, eh. Now, here's the thing when you made these decisions of what to eat, I'm willing to bet that you are not upset you were not angry you were not cursing yourself oh my gosh why did i do these things it's like at the end of a long day you come home and you say you know what i deserve and usually you fill that in with with what i don't know what do you deserve at you can long ipa day? you can right. go <laughs> <laughs> that's right like a beer a pizza a cheeseburger like something exactly. that's usually not good for you right now and you don't get because why because these indulgences make us feel good and we're just we're feelings based animals first and foremost so when you think about the kind of the science of selling and, and what you're leading with, features and functions don't generally inspire emotional reactions in our customers. And there's, and there's been studies done on this when, you know, they look at consumers and they, they, they actually rank all of the feelings that are manifested when they, they buy things. There was a study, it's called the New Science of Customer Emotions. I think this was 2015. And they looked, they, they determined there was like 10 big emotions associated with why people buy things. And it was like, a vision of my future self, safety and security, protecting the environment. So, you know, when you go on vacation or you buy a car and we're to ask you like, why did you, or, you know, you get a credit card or a mortgage or you do whatever it is, there's a certain emotional driver behind that. And so features and functions don't play into that. I mean, you might think some of these things are cool, but they don't establish that emotional connection with a customer. And that's why when you get emails from a, a vendor, it's entitled, here's what's new in 3.0. No one cares what's in 3.0. Right. Okay? right. People care about their pains and problems. So that's what you got to focus on. So it's even beyond then, because people say, well, they people buy from people, which is obviously true. But I guess maybe the next level of that is the feelings that people have. So it may not just be, yeah, you and I had a great conversation. I'm going to buy from him. It's, you know, it is, oh, he, he gets me. He understands where I'm trying to get to and those types of things. And I think that's that's a hard pivot so maybe you've got some some recommendations how to do it but the other thing i just want to go back you made the point about giving away stuff for free right giving back and and it took me forever to get to that point it was a well if i give away you know this framework then everybody's gonna be able to copy and see but honestly it was probably the last 18 months that it you know again content i'm putting out there i'm having more conversations and just telling people i mean this is this is how i would do it if you want my help great. I'd be happy to, but if not, you know, there's what the, the path look like. So one is that is it just human nature to hold on to everything that you have. And then two, you know, how do you, you know, it's right to break free, but is there some tips <laughs> to, to start to think about and act differently than maybe what we, we did in the past? Is you referring to content specifically or not? Yeah, content? I think, yeah, exactly. Content or if I'm a founder of a company and, you know, I don't may not want to give away a, a trial or a reduced price because I'm too early in the process. And then maybe that's a whole different discussion. So let's leave it at content as I'm starting to build out the brand. Yeah. You know, it's, I, and it's funny for me, I'm kind of uh, of two minds. Number one, to start putting in, you know, paywalls and gates and, you know, sign up forms, it creates a lot of friction. Right. And so the question I always think about, even from a science perspective, I actually talk a lot about this with my clients in terms of how they architect their sales calls. You're trying to get a customer, a buyer to do something that they may not be motivated to do. And that thing could be have a follow up call or buy your product or download a white paper or whatever it is. And so if you're putting too much friction in that process, then they're not going to do it. And so the easiest thing to do is just kind of give it away for free. And then put the kind of the sign up after the fact. Hey, look, if you like this, you know, if I've added value, consider signing up. And so I think that's the, the big thing with friction. People are, are, are too focused on the paywalls and the, the email scrapers and all that kind of stuff in terms of building your audience. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not saying that's wrong, 
but you, you're introducing unnecessary friction. It's like a sign up form on your website that has a million fields. Like people aren't going to fill that thing out unless they are really, really clear on the value they're getting. So, uh, and then you also have to ask yourself like, well, what's your product? Like, I'm not saying if you sell toasters to give toasters away for free, right? But, <laughs> but if you sell training, if you sell consulting, there's nothing wrong with giving an article away for free. You know, the, the best leaders and, and so on, I, I've seen consultants, they give away like little snippets because they add value in amongst themselves. They generate that sense of reciprocity and they give people like a little bit of a preview of what it would be like to work with you. Like I don't, I can honestly say in my business now, which I do primarily 80, 90% of my business is training B2B, you know, growth companies. And then about 10 to 20% of my business is paid speaking engagements. I can honestly say that no piece of content I put out is a, is a replacement for any, any piece of business that I would do. And, and the reality is if someone does think that they're going to read that article or download that video, and now they don't have to hire you, they probably weren't your ideal customer anyways. That's such a good point. Yeah. I had a fellow Canadian on not too long ago, John Vaughn. He sells basically local search SEO services to company helping small businesses of either get found and has been able to scale it. And one of the, the, the quotes that I love from him is, you know, he tells his prospects and customers, don't be sold, right? No matter if you buy from me or not, don't be sold. Educate yourself on the process, which I think then or the solution, whatever you're trying to solve you know, is going to, which again, opened my eyes that yes, it makes perfect sense. And I'm guessing, you know, the science in your research is going to say, yes, be more transparent, be educational. You know, people will see through, right? It's almost too hard with the content and the information's out there to, you know, quote unquote, fool somebody, right? And, and sell on something you can't do. So is that fair? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you're also we're also assuming that the person consuming the content is the buyer, right? And so, like, educate yourself, and and I think that's all true. But I'll tell you, like, a lot of you know, I'm really grateful. I mean, a lot of people that read and, and consume my content are sales reps and sales engineers and BDRs, and they're not in a position to hire me, right? You know, even even some people who might be sales leaders at big companies may not be in a position to to hire me. But what happens is, you know, when you seed these ideas. Those people share those ideas with their friends. And say, you should check it. You should check out this content or check out this book. And then there's like a bit of a groundswell. And so, you know, it's not uncommon for a bunch of reps at a company to start consuming my content and then go to their leader and say, we got to get this guy in to like, to help us here. Right. So you never know who you're going to impact and it's all over the world. Right. When you talk content wise, I'm super grateful. I've had people in, in Denmark and Australia, like send me screenshots of, you know, Hey, I just downloaded your book or I bought your book on this website with, with, with words I don't even understand, you know, like it's just amazing all over the place how how the ideas can kind of spark, can create sparks in people's minds, and and that can lead to things, consumption of content, and and again when they tell a friend, they may not be able to hire me, but they'll direct a friend to my website who then signs up for my email my email list, and then I can now send them content. So I'm playing kind of the long game here. I think you have to in this game, and it's so it's not just all about hitting that buyer with the right message at the right time. Yeah, it's about the education and it's so powerful in the sense of, you know, even the last, I joke, three or four or five years that it's really changed the buyer. I actually had a white, you know, white paper would be a slight exaggeration, <laughs> kind of an article on, you know, the B2B, the buyers have all the power now. And most organizations are not structured to support the way the buyer wants to buy. And again, one of the reasons I want to have you on is to help educate folks that, hey, you've got a chance as you're starting your company, you're starting to scale your company, you're going to bring salespeople in, now, how to best utilize, you know, that time. So is there, you, you mentioned kind of how you architect a sales call. And again, without giving away all the trade secrets, but enough to kind of how should a founder one, uh, so this is going to be a two part question. The founder think about, hey, I'm just starting to scale my company. I am our salesperson. I want to make the best use of my time. I don't want to waste prospects time. You always want to learn. And then two, as they start to transition to build beyond their network, you know, does the, does the dynamic change or is the, the approach the same? So I know I just gave you a bunch to think about, but what no. your perspective on that? Well, it's interesting, you know, having been a founder, work with a bunch of founders as a founder, I'll qualify this, but as a founder, like a lot of things are your fault. 
Okay. So, so what do I mean by that? Like a lot of people are saying, well, you know, I want to scale my business. I, I, as the founder have been really successful in, in articulating the value of what we do and I'm converting all these customers. And, and unfortunately, a lot of times what you're doing is you're converting them through your sheer passion, right? For what you do. It's not that you're actually saying and doing the right things, but you're the founder, you know, you have a certain gravitas that, that other people in your organization don't have. And then they say, okay, now I'm going to start hiring salespeople. And what they do is they go out, they hire some experienced salespeople, and then those salespeople quote unquote suck. And then we have to fire them. And then I end up speaking to these founders who are like, oh yeah, you know what? I hire all these you know, top-notch salespeople and they all suck. The only one that can sell anything is me and I'm not even a salesperson. And you, you know, nine times out of 10, I turn around and I'm like, this is your fault. It's your fault. <laughs> and, and the reason why it's your fault, it's not that these salespeople are bad, it's that you haven't armed them with the enthusiasm and the tools and the, and the messaging that they need to go and be successful. And I think the things that work for you as a founder won't work necessarily for the team members that you hire. So you need to be really good at kind of compartmentalizing and systematizing that message in a way that the people on your team can deliver in a very high conviction way, not being a founder. But also, you know, think about getting beyond your network. The people that know you, know what you stand for, and they, they, they're willing to give you more time and they're more intimately involved in your solution. People outside your network don't give a, don't give a crap about you, right? Right, yeah. And so, and so when they consume your content and message, it needs to be something that's more emotionally charged, more aligned with how the mass market would buy. And so, you know, the, the real trick in terms of hiring your sales team is don't think about it in terms of like, I'm going to give them the message and they're going to go out and they're going to go convert all these customers. Think about it as like, you have this opportunity to use these people to help you experiment. And in all of my startups, the message changed. Like the mission stayed the same, more or less, right? But when someone says, what you do, what do you do? The, the thing that we used to say changed over time. And it was, it was done and informed by what our salespeople were seeing in the field. Because as a founder, you're not always you're talking to customers, prospects, salespeople, BDRs, and so on are. And they need to be the, the messengers, but also the kind of the mad scientist and experiment with that message to know what works. But there's a, there is a big divide between founders and, and, and kind of, you know, the, the rest of the organization in terms of the gravitas and the message and, and the successful founders need to make that transition. Yeah, no, and it makes a lot of sense. And I'd also be curious, kind of a follow up from that. I did a very informal scientific study at the, in my last corporate role where we had probably 200 total salespeople, 120 outside, probably 50 inside, and then some SDRs. And trying to figure out why, you know, kind of like think what you were thinking, why were some successful and some were not so successful. And when I dug in across both, you know, the enterprise, the national, inside, every one of them was selling themselves, right? I can solve your problem. I know I'm super oversimplifying this, but that's what they were doing. They would talk to a boutique owner on inside sales and say, hey, I understand your problem and wow, how Facebook ads can help solve it. Where at the national levels, like we deal with this all the time. So they almost viewed them more as a subject matter expert than a sales. Is that consistent with what you've seen? I, that was a much smaller sample size. I'm just curious to get your perspective. Is that you know a good way to start thinking about how to go to market? Yeah, well, here's the thing. It, when I talk about like the science of discovery, you're on a call with someone and you want to know intimate details of your of their business. And you want to ask them all these questions and they're not motivated to tell you anything because who the hell True. are you? Right? So think about this. You know, if you ran into, this is a story I believe I tell in the book. I do tell in the book. If, if let's say you woke up with like a horrible, you know, stomach pain and, and you're like, I got to go to the doctor. And on the way to, the, so let's say you live in New York City and you're walking to the doctor like 10 blocks. And on the way, you run into someone on the street who, who looks concerned about you. He's like, hey, buddy, you, you seem like you're in rough shape. Are you okay? And, you're, and you say, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, I'm good. Right. And they're like, well, I don't, you don't look so fine to me. You say, oh, no, I'm good. And you press on. You know, if you continued walking and that person continued to follow you all the way to the doctor's office into the, you know, the, the examination room and that person turned out to be the doctor. Okay. Now you're standing in the same room as that person. They got the lab coat on. They ask you how you're doing. And you're like, oh, doc, I have this horrible stomach pain. They would say, well, why didn't you tell me on the street? And the reason you didn't tell them on the street, because you didn't see them as someone who could help you. Oh, and this yeah. happens all the time in sales. You know, people... They, they will not open up to you unless they see you as someone who can help them. Because if, if you, I know more than you on this topic, then why the hell am I trusting you to do anything? And this is especially prevalent when you have younger sellers selling to older, more experienced buyers whose job they've never done. I actually, 
I call this experience asymmetry. I talk about it in the book. I wrote a, a post in Harvard Business about a year ago on it. And it's this imbalance that gets creative. So what you're describing, when you come in and you're a subject matter expert, what you're, what you're describing is a situation where now that customer kind of sees you as the doctor, right? Now, the trick is maybe, maybe you're not the doctor. Maybe you just started in sales six months ago, or, the, or you're, you, maybe you have lots of sales experience, but you just started at the company. How do you manifest that conviction? How do you, how do you develop that doctor persona without the background and experience? That's what I actually help a lot of my clients do but recognize that the reason why that works is because people, but part of the elements of trust is expertise. I believe this person has the knowledge and experience to help me and they're looking for evidence of that. And so when you share things like third party research, articles, videos, things that aren't associated even with your brand that show you that you're educated, I read this book and I saw this, then it gives them confidence and hey, look, this, this is the doctor that can help me solve my business problem. Yeah. Without that, they're not gonna open up. No, it's so true and, and so good. And I think the, the, the value, which there's a lot for the founders is when you're thinking about your product solution, whether it's, you know, technology, or think about it from the customer's perspective and you can come in and say, we've got all these bells and whistles and do all these things. But unless you're answering the fundamental problem, the customer's having, and you can be perceived to say, Hey, I know what that problem is, right? I can help you solve it. And this is how we do it. So and the other thing I just want to piggyback a little bit off of, because I know you, your background was a sales engineer. And I think I read not too recently when Microsoft reorganized everything, right? And now they're the largest or they were, I haven't looked in a few weeks post COVID, you know, company in the world on market cap. One of the big things they did was when they reorg their sales organization was to move sales engineers into more sales roles because they had better engagement with the customers is it, it, is my getting that story right have you heard that or i'm guessing it wouldn't surprise you if they did it other than maybe that it's at the enterprise level i, I hadn't heard that but no i believe it you know so when i was a sales engineer it was an enterprise software we would sell to airlines banks i've spent a lot of time in chicago where you are there you know selling to united airlines you know we we would have these demos that would last three days these sales cycles could be 12 to 18 months or longer and it was really really uh, great to be able to kind of see that cycle from end to end but as a sales engineer you know we did a lot we were almost i didn't realize it at the time because i was a bit younger but my 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 leadership team was using me almost like as a secret weapon it's like here's a person without a sales title that knows a lot about the, the solution that can get into parts of the organization that the sales guy can't, right? And have really deep, authentic conversations because they're bringing tons of value around the solutions and what they're seeing. So I absolutely believe that sales engineers are the unsung hero. Shout out to all of you if you're listening. Um, of 100% the sales with you. <laughs> Especially in, in enterprise sales. Yeah. And then just to, to kind of tie off on the founders, you know, as they start to, you know, introduce their product and the problems they solve, have you seen more success if you pick, you know, a single vertical, right? Because you know what problems you're solving, but you know, what I'll use is my, the old geo digital days, you know, we sold into SMB and the conversation we had with the lawyer was very different than a plumber or a roofer, or at least it needed to be right. So when you advise your clients, are you saying, Hey, pick a vertical to start or at least educate yourself on the different verticals? What's kind of the best best practices when you're, you're starting to do that versus yeah. chasing the shiny object. <laughs> this is something we did a lot at Salesforce because one of the things we did, especially in small business. So I ran small business for the Eastern U S at Salesforce. And so our customers were these growth customers and they were always curious about, okay, at that time, Salesforce was a 16 year old company, a, you know, $10 billion. How did you do it? Cause you were like us, you know, some, some of those companies had started 16 years ago themselves and they were still small businesses. So what did you do? And so the question of like, how do I, you know, kind of divide and align my sales motion, you know, as we grow depends on a few things. It could be, for example, you just have one product that you sell to one type of customer, in which case you might want to align yourself geographically, right? So you might say, well, I, I work with this customer down the road from you and this, you know, so, so there's like that geographic element. You could align based on customer size. So you might say, hey, look, you know, I, I sell this one product to customers all over the world, but the degree of freedom and how I position it depends on the size of the customer. Small business customers, I, I have a different value proposition for big ones. And then you might also do vertical. 
right? So like this industry has these particular pains. And so again, it all depends. If you look at those three dimensions, it all depends how much variability are there in those three things. Like if you just sell the same product to the same customer and the only difference is geography or maybe the, you know, and, and, or, you know, maybe it's the same geography, but different vertical. So you have to figure out. Now the question is like, which one should I move into first? There's no right answer, right? right. Like, but the, but the idea is like, pick one first. Now, if you look at Salesforce, now as a mature company, they have different customer sizes, different verticals, different geographies, sub geographies, you know, uh, then they have specialists by product line. So they're to the nth degree, very segmented. So for you, in your business, I don't know what the right answer is, but, but think about like, where are you going to get the most bang for your buck in terms of that first degree of segmentation and then move to the other ones as you grow? Yeah, that's so good. And I think it, a good, you know, kind of pivot point is as you're starting to hire sales reps, make sure that they do have the technical experience to be able to sell your product or service, but probably more importantly, or equally important, have they sold into the industry that you're targeting, right? I guess it's, can you train it or sell it? But I've seen that where, you know, founders bring in a really qualified sales rep that knows this product but has never sold into that industry and they struggle because, or it takes a much longer learning curve and ramp up in order to do that. So interesting. All right. So I, I'm going to be respectful of your time. We're starting to run low, but I do have one other question that I get quite a bit and founders, salespeople that, you know, I don't like to sell or I'm not selling because I don't like to ask for the business and I put that the polite way, right? It's closing the deal. And, you know, my, my thoughts always been right. If you're adding value and you're solving a problem, this is what it costs to solve the problem. But I'm sure you see this all the time. And what, what's your advice or recommendation to those folks that say, Hey, I'm more than comfortable talking to a prospect about our service and our solution. And it's a good fit. Is that a DNA question or can it be taught? No, you know what, you know, I feel, so asking a customer for money, which seems like a very basic skill is, is definitely something that doesn't come naturally to people. Like they feel like, oh, I don't want to like ask about money. Like this is for whatever reason, it's taboo. They don't want to talk about it. But I also feel that one of the reasons why people don't feel comfortable asking customers for money is because they may not believe completely in their solution. And, you know, if you believe in something wholeheartedly, then you manifest a natural conviction around it. Hopefully you can tell that I love doing what I do. And if I asked you like, what is something you love? Oh, I love baseball or this team or bluegrass music, whatever it is. And I asked you to talk about it, you would manifest this kind of natural conviction. But when it comes to, you know, technology solutions, or, or let's say we have a great solution, but man, like our customers have had a hard time kind of getting up and running with it, or they haven't had the success that we thought that they would have. And now I'm going toe to toe with you. And I got to tell you, this thing is going to cost, you know, 50 grand a year. I become emotionally encumbered. And that makes it difficult for me to like, because uh, I, I don't believe in the solution. And in fact, this is a big issue for most of us, especially in B2B technology sales, because, you know, what we sell is kind of abstract. We, you know, it's, we're not, we're not feeding starving children in third world countries. We're not curing disease. True. Some of us are, most of us aren't. And so we kind of feel a little guilty about, I don't know, asking $50,000 for what? Like software, like air, like, I don't, you know, what is this? And so, you know, I would say for you, you know, get, you just have to get comfortable asking for money, but also have confidence in the value of what you provide. I'll tell you, like, even in my business now, you know, being three years in, what I charge now is way different than what I charged at the beginning. And the pro, I can't, and, you know, let's say what I charge now is, you know, X amount more than what I used to. It's not that what I delivered on day one was X amount worse. It was, it was maybe 50% less effective than what I do now. But now I have a lot more conviction in it because I've been doing it and I've seen the impact it can have. And so I have no problem asking for money for it. And if you don't want to spend the money with me, that's okay too. You know, everyone has their price point and the thing they're looking for. It probably means that, you know, maybe you're not my ideal customer. But for my ideal customer, for the value that I add, you know, I have conviction that like what I'm asking for is absolutely reasonable. And so it makes that just having that, that conviction makes it so much easier to, to, to ask the question. Yeah, that is so true. And I didn't even thought of it that way, but that's right. Confidence, conviction. And, you know, my daughter gets mad when I tell the story, but she had a, an internship where she was selling at Trunk Club, right? Which 
And the only reason I tell the story is that she had, it was a combination of cold call and it was a combination of, you know, in network. And she was much more comfortable talking to people she didn't know about selling the service than it was the people in her network. And, you know, that goes back to a great training or a sales tip that, hey, how do you make that there is value in everything that we're doing? They're going to, you have to believe that they're going to get value with it. So I never had thought about, never put two and two together, but it makes perfect sense. And it's something easy that these founders can do as they start to scale is make sure your salespeople have conviction in what you guys are selling. And if not, either you don't have the right person or figure out how to gain the, the conviction in it, right? Well, also the message too. I love, so first of all, Trunk Club, I talk about Trunk Club in my book because when they went to market, what are they? They're an online, if I said, what Trunk Club, what do you do? Technically, what are they? They're like an online service where you put it, is it for men? You put in your measurements and they send you a box of clothes every month. And that doesn't sound exciting at all. But what they, what they led with, and they were a big Salesforce customer, which is why I know, they led with a message of men love to dress well, but they hate to. Yep. What do they hate to do? Shop. Shop. They hate to shop, right? And so now if you're a man and you love to dress well and you hate to shop, you're like, you're leaning in and you're saying, this is, a, what is this? And they're not talking about the, fee- they didn't say, oh, it's an online service where you put it, like, no one cares. If you're yeah. a man, you love to dress well, you hate to shop, you're going to lean in and say, tell me more. So I think they really nailed the message. I mean, they got acquired by Nordstrom for like $300 million, so good for them. But, you know, they really nailed the messaging. So I, I love that example of, of Trunk Club. But here's the thing. Now you're your daughter and now you have to go out and you have to ask people for money. It's a lot easier to go out there with conviction when you have a message that you know resonates with your target audience than when, when you're talking about features and functions, right? So if she so says, true. men love to dress well, they hate to shop. And the person on the phone says, hell yeah. Now it's a lot easier for me to ask you for money. Yeah, no. And that's, that's so true. And great, great vet advice for founders as they're thinking about this. And I know I said that was going to be the last question, but I got one more <laughs> as a follow-up. And, you know, there's debate, what I would call traditional old school sales orgs that, hey, we're just going to cold call the hell out of it until we get to our number. And I kind of sit on the other side that if you can drive more inbound traffic through messaging and engagement, whatever that is, obviously it's much easier as you got inbound to convert. But as a founder, I may have to do some outreach. People may not be consuming my content. Any advice or recommendations on the best way to cold call if you have to cold call? I mean, I think I know the answer based on our conversation, but I'd love to get kind of your answer to this. Well, look, how to have a good cold, that's a whole other podcast altogether. <laughs> but, but like back to my initial thing of like when a good cold call is almost like a good newspaper article. The purpose of the title is to get you to read the first line and the purpose of the first line is to get you to read the second line and so on. So, you know, you can you, when you start the call, you have to start, you know, from a position of, of empathy, but also strength highlight, you know, what's in it for this customer to even continue the conversation with you. And oftentimes if you started, Hey, it's David calling from, you know, cerebral selling, we're a platform that allows people to do blah, 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 like people to tune out. Like, in fact, right. you know, people are, are completely sensitized to being pitched to your point, like customers hate being sold. When you get a call from a telemarketer, it takes you a split second to tell that that's a telemarketer calling you with a script. And so it's the same thing with your, your cold call and your outreach. You know, be human, be, have conviction, be empathetic, but, but lead with that emotion. Lead with the problem your customer is looking to solve. So they lean in and they say, tell me more. Like you have to earn the right to have that extra 30 seconds or extra two minutes. Lead with that, that mission that you have, feeling the emotion. You're going to be in good shape. No, that's awesome. And so true. And with that, I think that's a good place to end the lesson, if you will, today. But I do like to always ask, you know, so what's what's next for you? You've got the book that's out there. You've got the uh, training slash agency that you'd provide. You know, what's what's next for for you and the team? Yeah, no, look, you know, the book just came out at the beginning of April. So, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, of course. So there's still a lot, a lot more to do on that front. Get the message out there. You know, I continue to do my, my training and speaking, but yeah, just kind of writing this message. Partially, the reason I do what I do in my mission is because I love sales and it bothers me that people don't, people think you're the enemy, right? When you're, when you tell them you're in sales. So that's, you know, I'm, I'm motivated by the mission. The book is part of that mission. So, you know, just keep, keep preaching, keep training, keep, keep teaching. 
and, and putting the message out there, uh, continuing to write. I believe, you know, the secret to growing a business isn't, you know, you just do this one thing and, and, and you're, you're all good to go. It's just being consistent, just being consistent, be present, keep putting out content that all pulls in the same direction. So that's, that's what I'm focused on. Yeah, that's awesome. And I highly encourage anybody in the audience that's struggling with sales, thinking about sales, whether you're a founder or not, to go pick up this book. I, again, I'm passionate about the approach, you know, 25 plus years, you know, in and out of sales organizations. And he's right, the buyers have changed. And I think his approach, it's hard to argue with science and it's hard to argue with the numbers. And it's a like I said, it's not one of these, what would you call it, a textbook, right? You're going to learn how to do it, but it's not 400 pages of equations, right? So, That's right. Yeah. So so awesome. Well, would, I really appreciate your time today, David. And I always like to close with one final question, which is, what is one thing that you would highly recommend? Read. That's it. You know, you can learn a lot by doing, for sure. You can learn a lot by, by speaking to people. But, you, you know, reading is a thing that is so simple to do. Most people don't do it. You know, I heard a statistic that the average college graduate reads half a book a year in the area of their, you know, professional expertise. So if you just read like a couple books a year, you're like way ahead of the game. Just read. Uh, there's so much knowledge and nuance that can help you in your role. And especially as a B2B founder, there's so much failure that people have experienced that they've overcome that they've written about in books. And there's no reason for you to experience that same failure if someone else <laughs> did it and, 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 you know, and, and codified it for you. So, so just get in the habit of reading. I know a lot of B, B2B founders do read, but that would just be my simple tip is just prioritize reading. And a hundred percent agree. Great advice. And the world we live in is rapidly changing. So what you knew yesterday may not be, you know, as relevant or as accurate tomorrow. So Again, David, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And if people want to learn more, you know, what's the best place for, for people to reach out? We'll, of course, add it to the show notes. But what's your preferred method of contact? Yeah, I mean, it's, I'd say there's three things. Number one, the website is a great source of information. So CerebralSelling.com, one word, CerebralSelling.com. Tons of, of articles. There's a link to my YouTube channel, which is also Cerebral Selling, which you, you can search up on YouTube. I give everything away for free. You don't have to register for anything. And the book is called Sell the Way You Buy. There's information about it on the website, but you can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Indigo, wherever you buy books. Yeah, awesome. And like I said, we'll have to have you back on to talk about one of your uh, your startups that you actually sold the Salesforce in, in a different episode. But again, thank you for sharing your expertise, your knowledge. This is highly valuable. And yeah, we'll catch up with you in the not too distant future. Oh, thanks so much, Brett. Pleasure right, being here. Have with a you. great rest of your day. You too. <laughs>